All right. All right, Stan, I'm going to keep my uh, going to keep my Facebook volume down, but I'll be able to read the questions. Okay. Can and you hear me okay? I think I can hear you great. I can hear you just fine. You can hear me fine. And let's see, it takes a minute for this thing to. Okay. We're rocking and rolling, buddy. Welcome, Stan Lynch. Wow. Before, before I forget, too, I know people watching out there are going to probably already know this, but if they don't, I want them to know that last week you celebrated your birthday. I won't mention which one. But um, what? Happy, <laughs> it was the, uh, yeah. The I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> I'm a senior, baby. It <laughs> it's amaz it's a, I'm amazed. Uh, no, you look great, man. You look great. You, you, it was so great to talk this week and, and really sort of catch up. And, and uh, yeah, life is, is treating you very well, I can see. It's, I have a good hand of cards. I've been very fortunate. Great. And uh, I just got to say, too, that, you know, for all the drummers watching and there's uh, Ron Haynes says happy birthday. Rob. Oh, look at all these people watching already. Cool. Thank you. Um, I feel the love. Yeah. He, and you he, see that you feel the love. And, and uh, there's a lot of it already. I can tell you. Um, but I just want all the drummers out there watching. I know there's already a bunch watching that the drum kit behind Stan. And we'll talk about this in some detail. But we so much stuff we're going to want to talk about and. I don't want to keep Stan on the line for the whole day, but that drum kit, his Tama Imperial Star kit over his shoulder is the kit that he recorded basically everything from Damn the Torpedoes on with all those songs, which when we did our little interview for the drum magazine last year, that was a huge eye opener for me. I didn't realize that. That one kit had sort of done my, my career. <laughs> well, I don't know about that because you had some big records before then, but that was not really. I mean, we we done a couple albums with, uh, I you know with, you know when you're a kid you drag your rig out to California. You know you load it all up in your bus, and I ran out there with my drum set that I wish I still had. It was a, <clears throat> it was a Thermogloss, Ludwig, you know olive badge, uh, 24, 13. 16 or might have been it yes no might have been at 18. yeah yep like a baby bonzo you know and a, what a great drum set and then i had a little gretch kit that was like a jazzers kit that was so cool and i've been i actually found the kit that had been so modded that i didn't really want it back it was a 20 a 12 and a 14 beautiful jasper square badge yep. that's what we made the first record with a hodgepodge of those two you know, like the um, the kick wasn't quite enough what we were looking for, so we used the olive badge and the Gretsch toms, and and the first couple of records we did were so bizarrely recorded, and you know they were done almost as demos. You know, they were we didn't nobody knew what they were doing. There was no real producer. There were these two uh, characters that did a lot of acid, like daily <laughs> as a part of a religious. Thing. Uh, yeah. They were lovely men. And, um, but they were basically recording our first two records. So we were flying blind. And so by the time we uh, hit the third record and Jimmy Iovine and Shelly Ackes came in the picture and heard us rehearse. And I had brought my little hodgepodge kit. And um, Shelly, who I didn't know from Adam, but you know, you knew his, you know, this is the guy who goes all the way back to moon dance and, schools out and you know just every you know all these cool records when i was you know coming up and he kind of looked me over and he went like you know you seem like a decent fella these drums you know like uh, -uh. and the coolest thing i don't know if this even happens anymore he took me drum shopping you know shelly took me to music stores and we listened to drums and he was hearing you know i didn't you know he's hearing what the microphone's hearing and i'm not even you know all i know is you put up a, a microphone you know, I've made two records. I hadn't, didn't even really notice where they put microphones. You know, we were still a live band, essentially. And, uh, Shelley picked out the Imperial Stars. Wow. And he said, you know, this is probably the sound we're looking for. You know, I want a big, resonant, 
And he had, you know, because I was going, oh, the drums going to sound good? And he's like, you have no idea, you know? So <laughs> he was, I think he actually pointed out early, he said, you know, there's going to be guys in, in the band that are going to be probably pretty jealous because of all the room we're going to be using for these drums. And it, it came to pass. I mean, I would see them on the console at Sound City, you know, half the console was drum mics. You know, it looked like I was having a press conference. You know, there was, and it was fantastic to, you know, and then he, he actually let me ride fills in the mix back when you were, you know, mixing was a, a hands-on operation. He'd go, you know, you can go let the lever about a little on your fills. And then I took advantage and they started duct taping. And then they gave me fake faders. You know, I realized they weren't anything. They're like, well, great job, Stan. And I'm like, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know, <laughs> ego, you know. Anyway, but yeah, he, the drum kit, the story on the drum kit is Shelly really picked out those shells and they're all different sizes. He got me one of everything and they're really were cool. 1979, still made in Japan. I imagine they probably still are. And, um, and he, he just, they settled on uh, superphonic snare drums. Yeah. I showed him everything I had, which wasn't much, but he said six and a half by 14, olive badge, that's your drum. You know, and he said, so really any record I came in, I would try something. And because uh, the drums were actually not very comfortable to play. They were so detuned. This was back when you, know, you couldn't sample. So yeah. you, had, you, know, you made a sound. And I mean, it was literally like pulling your hand out of play, you know? It was like no rebound. And I remember going like, you know, before there were clicks too. So you're like trying to lean into it and they're, it's kind of dragging a little bit. I'm like, dude, I'm back here like hauling logs up a hill, you know? Yeah, and man. So I was always trying to go with another drum set. And anytime I would, they would, like Tom would just look at me and go, bring your kit. You know, like, like what are you doing? And then finally I got with uh, Jeff Chonis. Yeah, uh, drum paradise, and he took over because it was still. I didn't have a drum tech then. You know, the first, the third or fourth albums, we weren't quite that sophisticated yet. We were <laughs> in that taint region of success. And by the time Chonis showed up, he he put the case. You know, I still had soft cases. I was taking my drums no to the wow. cases for, for uh, and the torpedoes and the. Our promises record. I was hauling them out of my house, you know, out of like my my closet, you know. So you know all that heavy hardware and crap. And finally, <laughs> Charles was like, have you ever considered, you know, <laughs> go to the party, you know? But oh man, that's good. again eye opening. I did not know that. And and someone and you just answered a question I think that someone had asked, which is what was the snare on "Here Comes My Girl"? So it was a, a Ludwig 402 six and a half by fourteen Ludwig. Probably, yeah. Guessing with a with a control spot, <clears throat> yep. And like probably a little duct tape wad of, you know, tissue or something, or or, wad or something sitting on there and <clears throat> making it impossible to play. And you had to tune it every third take. I had to go to the piano. Yeah. Like he made me take my drums and tune to a triad to the piano every third take. Like which was probably fine because. The band, after three takes, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that's a, an incredible amount. It's still white collar crime, but it's, it is 15 to 20 minutes of, of labor. Yeah. So they were ready for a break. I was ready for a break. Like, they got so sick of it. I mean, we were cutting, I don't know, you know, 40 takes of things sometimes. And wow. Only to find out that take seven was the one. But... We didn't know. We didn't know that you could cut between takes. We, and we didn't, we were actually so unsophisticated that Tom, you know, he was probably 10 feet in front of me when we were tracking. And uh, we would both try to get a live, we were all trying to get a live take, like vocally too, you know, because yeah. vocal <laughs> on his 57 with that little bit of slap back that he liked to sing to was a little bit of part of the drum sound. Oh, so, dig it. Okay. It really was a live band pretty much almost with my whole tenure, you know, until the, and, it, you know, until they, until everybody figured out, you know, that, that you can make records a different way. You know, it doesn't have to be quite so laborious and tedious. 
right. open up a few more opportunities that can occur with that aren't purely live, you know. And 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 you had to, you told me this before too. I mean, you you had to really hit the drums hard to oh. to, to get the sound. So so that contributed to them having you had to retune them and they detune after. And they were also at the edge of their tuning capacity. Yeah. The yep. Lugs were all. I won't say they were hand tightened. But like we had jokes, like, you know, does the bass drum feel like a right melon? You know, like, can you push, you're getting a, a, like a full inch of excursion on that kick drum. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah. those sounds are, um, and it's kind of interesting. They're, they're really not bad. Like it's um, live in a room. When I tune this kit, you know, down to those specifications, I go kind of go there occasionally. It's pretty cool. It's a very limited vocabulary. It really limits your drummers, the vocabulary. You only get like a few vowel sounds, you know, because you, you know, you don't have a lot to work with, but this, the, the actual resonance is like, it's the equivalent of, of, of sustain. I mean, it's just, yeah. but you gotta work it. You know, you gotta work it. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. I wouldn't advise it. And it's also the physical component of playing that hard. It's on um, yeah. we'll later, you know? I got, I got things that don't feel quite so good, you know, but, but that's, you know, part of the deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, well, you know, I remember reading something that Tom said uh, about you years ago and he, and he, and he made reference to, you know, you being a big guy and just having a lot of power. And it was a cool quote. I'm trying to remember, I, I should have looked this up, but he said, basically you, you had like this fifth gear that you could go to, like, just when you think that, you know, you, you've kind of like, you, you've, you've hit all the RPM you're going to get to. There's like another gear that you could go to. I mean, maybe he was referring to live, but. Um, well, it wasn't just me. There was a lot, there was a lot of uh, exuberance in those people. You know, those five guys, you know, together. Yeah. Were, they were always proving it to each other. You know, it wasn't like, it was, you know, early, the, the, the first run, you know, the first, five or six records were, it was really a, a band. I mean, it was, it's make or break it every track. I mean, nobody, nobody phoned it in. Yeah. Yeah. It was inspiring, you know, and you know what that's like as a drummer, it's inspiring when somebody sitting right next to you is almost in your face in a positive way. Like, yeah. like it's like spurring you on, like you're a horse at that point in your life. And it's like, you're getting the, like, let's go. And yeah. Yeah. Tom was great at that, but the whole band was great at that. You know, Ben was fantastic. Mike, they were wonderful guys who have, um, you know, to, to gone gone to the trenches with. I mean, there was, nobody ever hung back. You know, they let it all hang out. It was pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Hey, I just Stan, I just want to read you uh, a comment from B.J. Epstein, um, who said that um, I think there's a comment before it, but I'm just seeing what he said here. Riding on a giraffe in the desert of Israel, Howie always said Stan is his best friend in the band. That's beautiful. Giraffe, I, I hope he means camel. Oh, <laughs> he probably means a camel, but he, he did say giraffe. Well, you know, it's easy to mix them up. I guess. Beach, uh, that's Howie's brother, man. He's a, he's a good dude. And you know I love Howie. You know? I know you do. I know. We all love Howie. Yeah. yeah. I, good dude. Yeah. Nice. Um, you know, I wanted to, if we could, I'm so glad we got into the drum thing because I, I didn't, I, I definitely wanted to talk about that and, and continue talking about it. But I, I wanted to just sort of jump back a second and, and talk about like your early influences as a drummer. Um, I know you started you, when you were around 12, 11 or 12. You're about 11, right. Well, yeah. Uh, I took lessons, you know, I went and took lessons. It was a rudimental, it was a guy, Gene Bardo. Yeah. Really he was a percussionist, I believe, at U of F, you know, in Gainesville. And um, he had a little red drum set in the corner. And it was, I was not allowed to sit behind it. He just almost was like, I don't want you to be a drummer. You're going to be a percussionist. That was his thing. And he was an elegant guy. And he knew all his rudiments. He was absolutely like, like bullets coming out of his hands when he played rudiments on a pad. You know, every, every beat was metronomically brilliant. And uh, he made me sit on a rubber pad for about 18 months, 
you know, to learn, I had to learn the 13 essential and then there were 20, you know, the 26. And um, I have my, I have my diploma actually in the back of my studio, my, my NARD diploma. And um, it was really cool. And then finally I told him, I said, when can I play the drums? And he said, like, you know, I had higher hopes for you. And that's where we parted company. He said, like, that's beneath you. You know, like any, basically his thing was any monkey can play a drum kit. It takes a, a dedicated musician to be a percussionist. And, um, and I was like, but I was already, I had already drank all the rock and roll Kool-Aid by 13. You know, the Beatles had been on Ed Sullivan. You know, it's like, yeah. <clears throat> you, it. you know what I mean? The marimba sounds great, but Ringo's a lot more fun looking to me. You know, that looks, and so, by, by the time, you know, by the time the Brit British invasion occurred, you know, I, I just threw my life away. I knew that that's, you know, I, I'm out of high, you know, there, there's nothing you're gonna keep me in school for. I'm not going to continue in education. I could give a shit. This is the program, and, you know, and if, yeah, and thank God, you know, like it's, but yeah, so the, um, the earliest influences was the first 45 I ever bought for a drum part is weird. It's, I think it's called um, whatever shape your stomach's in. And it was a 45 by the T-Bones. And I bought that because they had a drum break in it. Yeah. Team beat, you know, boom, pop, pop, boom, pop, boom, pop, pop. And uh, I, lo and behold, I go back to look at who's on the record. Of course, it's Hal Blaine, you know. Yeah. It's the most swinging thing and there's a drum break in there that he just plays the beat and the, in the end he comes out and da -da 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 and it's just so rocking and I would sit at my practice pad until my father at, would just go like about enough of that you know and, <laughs> and I just wore the T-Bones record out you know I buy 45s but that that's the first time I became aware that like there's this swing happening in drums that it's not just a beat it's a it's it was like for a white kid that was tribal. Yeah, yeah. Like that's as cool. I I didn't know that it got even deeper. You know what I mean? I just knew that this is like wow. So uh, without even knowing it, the great Hal Blaine had already like entered my life, by seventh grade. You know, and then uh, I guess the first guys. You know what? You know, I went to, you go to see rock and roll shows, you know, you sort of sneak out, you're 15, you're 16, you know, you grab, you know, my buddies, I was already playing in bands with guys who were five years older than me. So great. They all had cars and girlfriends and, you know, my parents had split up. So I'm like, let's go. So we would, you know, I saw the first bands I saw were sort of like, you know, Ian Pace, Deep Purple. Mm. Would, you know what I mean? Like, you go like, Mick Fleetwood put me in a trance. Yeah. And I went home and I, I bought, um, I think it was Kiln House at the time. And there was a song called Station Man. And it was like six minutes of a groove. But he's not just playing up, down, up, down. He's like, he's just mixing it up. And I'm going, yeah. Yeah. But, but no fills, really. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just groove. And he hypnotized me. And I think, you know, right around that time, I probably discovered weed and killing, you know, like Station Man. And then Simon Kirk, I went and saw Free, you know, and I just like, my brain exploded with that British dignity and power. He played traditional. Yeah, yeah. It was just, holy shit. You know, I mean, you know, and he, he's sort of a Nordic god anyway, you know, and it's like and yeah. he's playing the shit out of these drums, but so simply and he's just pulling the sound out I mean, it just drove me nuts and then of course Charlie you know you saw the stones on Ed Sullivan and you just went the, the, the class like even when Charlie was like you know digging in hard he just, just that's the coolest looking you know great yeah. drum great good, you know and then, you know Ringo of course you know just you and um you know Mitch Mitchell the fluidity of when I would see Mitch Mitchell play I would just go like my god he's it's, it's, he's flying, you know, he's just flying on top. And he was, you know, I think we, the Hendrix, that was just a magic thing that those two guys, uh, uh, Dino Dinelli, you know, I saw him on a couple, you know, I'd see Dino Dinelli and the sound of his drums and, and he was so physical, you know, like you'd go like, 
oh my god you know and then um i yeah, i know and all those guys you i mean they were huge I, i'm a little bit younger than you but same deal with me like as far as you know a time to be a drummer with those guys oh. you able to see them on tv or listen to them on the radio and well later in life i discovered why I, like other i like you know earl palmer cloud slides double field yeah junior those kind of guys came later to me although i i had totally dug their music but i didn't realize that they were actually human beings doing this and uh you know, Hal Blaine, Jeff Picaro, Jim Keltner, you know. Uh, when I first got to LA, I had a broken down Volkswagen bus that broke down on Laurel Canyon, and I parked it inadvertently in front of Jeff Picaro's house. No kidding. Who came out, I had long hair. He's not that much older than me, you know. Yeah. Looked much cooler. He's like got the great glasses, got great clothes, and, and he goes like, uh, what's the problem? You know, he's got a great voice, you know. Yeah, man. Cars, you know, he's just too cool. And yeah. uh, here my bus broke down, you know, it's like, New musician. I'm like, yeah. You know, I said, play the drums. Then it, the nickel drops. I realized it's Jeff Picaro. Oh shit. And he goes, well, come on and use the phone. And he played me a track. Of course, I'm living in a basement, you know, like for 40 bucks a month with my friends from Florida. You know, I'm, it's, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I got a broken Volkswagen bus. I go into his apartment, which is beautifully decorated, as you can imagine. You know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's got a, beautiful Reebok quarter inch reel to reel machine, you know, like, it's like, holy shit, he's, Jane, he's, he's, a, he's a James Bond character, you know, and he's yeah. pretty sure he played me on Black Friday, oh, man. you know, off of Katie Live. Yeah, yeah. Like, Here's what I've been up to. And I go like, wow, you're a guy I probably I would love it if you'd stay in touch with me. And he says, what's your band like? I told him about my band. He said, oh, you're yeah, like a Southern band, like Leonard Skinner? Like, Not really. I, you know, and he was really cool to me. He was so nice. I mean, you know, later I got to re-meet him again when I was working with uh, Luke, Steve Lukather. And, yeah. we'd write, and I'd get be writing songs for Toto. And they would say, come on down to the session. And I got to see... Jeff play and I got to see Jeff play on some Don Henley stuff that just it ripped my head off you know like it, he was he was absolutely a, a wonder to watch you know yeah. and it, he would he would have a take he actually his first take was a take but then he would pur purposely and willfully I believe sort of jinx it like and then go all right let's take one because he knew everybody would settle for that. And he knew he had a better one. I really believed, I really believe he was like, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. that's so funny. Yeah. Because he had it. Like, you just roll it, roll it. And he, you know, he'd have a chart. Just listen, go, I think I know what you want. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, Stan, that's the opposite of our friend Rick Murata, who I, I mentioned because he's watching right now, I can see who, and I say this, you know, obviously in jest, but who would do anything to just, just do one take and get the hell out of there. So. <laughs> Another reason why Rick is is really, you know, not someone we should praise. Not someone we should ever. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I'll let you say it. <laughs> but but um, I'm trying to think. Mick Avery from, from the Kings. Oh, yeah. Wow. And uh, and then later, I, I'm Keith Moon, of course, you know, just because he was Keith Moon. I mean, like, yep. my God, you know, I mean, uh, there's no mistaking anything Keith Moon comes within like 10 miles of. You know, and then Ginger Baker, I discovered actually his, how great he is later. I I accepted that that was you know Sunshine and Love was really great until I sat down one day and went, what's he really doing? Holy shit, this is good. This is yeah. really good. the sound. And then uh, you know you discovered you discovered guys later. You know like uh, like Greg Bissonette and Myron turned me on to how great Louis Belson is. You know, and they took me to the Catalina Club one day to see him play. And, you know, you know, I just, it was amazing. And then he comes over to the table and um, I remember, you know, I, I just say, I was looking for something to say and it was true. I said, that was the most incredible press role I've ever heard ever played. And it was, he did like an extended press role that just, I don't even know. And he goes, uh, he goes, I forget, I want to get it right. He said, um, yeah, you want it to sound like you're tearing paper. 
And I thought, wow. And then he said something like, he goes up. He said something like, I'm still working on it. I could totally hear him say that, yeah. It blew my mind, because I thought, here he is, he's teaching and learning, and he's like, got nothing to prove, you know, but he's like, he's still engaged, and, you know, I'm getting a, a front row seat because I'm with Vincent Admiron, who he does know, and it was really cool. It, that kind of stuff was, uh, and here's an obscure drummer that kind of knocked me out when I came to California. It was, uh, I had eight track tapes and I played this, there was a band called Trapeze. Mm, yeah. I Dave Holland. Yep. Um, there was a song called Midnight Flyer and it was so flat. The drums were like no verb and the track was unbelievable. And it was just, uh, there were things like certain drum tracks just freaked me out. Like, I just went, wow, I gotta, I gotta have some of that. You know, I gotta know if I can get to some of that. And I think that was always in my mind when you're cutting with a band, you're going like, what would he do? What would Dave do? Or what would Mick Fleetwood do? You know, well, he'd just go four on the floor. What would Charlie do? You know, not that you're ever gonna get there, but it's like, or Ringo, you know, you're, or any of those cats, you just you try to pull it out of your ass when you don't know what to do. And, and Kelter was so great because he would always give early in life, he gave me the advice, when you don't know what to do, put one hand behind your back. And I was like the most amazing thing that happens when you do that. Yeah, yeah. You might be overworking. They just want to hear a rhythm. They just want to hear a groove. They don't want to hear you working so damn hard and trying to figure out all the gears and the, you know, it's rock and roll, man. Like get a pulse. And he was, he was instrumental in getting me that, to the part in, that in breakdown because I couldn't swing, I couldn't shuffle, you know. So he got me there with the one hand. Is that okay? Because I I, I was thinking about that song this morning, and uh, and I I just gonna I'm gonna say this before I forget to say it. And there's a question too from our friend Dave Maddox. I'm, I don't want to forget to ask you, but but you know when you mentioned Keltner, you mentioned all these guys like iconic drummers, Ringo, Charlie, Jim, Jeff, um, Hal Blaine. And I put you in that category. And our friend Rick, I hate to say it because he's probably still listening, but I <laughs> put him in that category too. And Dave Maddox. But but like, and I'll just say as a drummer listening to you, <clears throat> as a I started listening to you around 1976, 77. So I was around 16 or 17. I've been playing a few years. And it was like, it took me a while to realize what I loved about you so much. And then I, what I loved about Ringo and Charlie and Levon Helm was your feel. But it, when you, you know, when you're young and dumb, you don't sort of understand the importance and the nuance of, of what a great feel is. No. And, and I've told you this a million times. And, and I remember like when Damn the Torpedoes came out, my band, we covered a bunch of the songs and um, Here Comes My Girl and Refugee, especially. I just could not and, you know, we'd, we'd get through them and the guys in the band were kind of like, yeah, it's, yeah, you, you know, you played the part. But in my mind, it was always like, God, I sound like shit. This is just not happening. It's just not. And I still, when we play your songs <laughs> now, you know, it's I, a lot of nights I'm listening and I'm going, thank God Stan is not in the room right now because he'd maybe throw something at me. It's, it's. Uh, every drummer has a chemistry and a biology and a, and a place that they sort of start from. I think every drummer, you know, we have a comfort zone. You know, like when you sit down, I, I'm, I'd venture to guess 90% of the drummers always sit down and kind of do the same thing. Yeah. That's what I think. They all sit down, you know, when they're kind of alone, they, you know, they, they start where they live, you know, they just yeah. kind of, and I think that fortunately for me, what I happen to do fairly naturally was what the band needed at the time. So it wasn't like a stretch for me. It wasn't like I had to go like, gosh, I hope I can get, well, here comes my girl's a perfect example. I was trying to ape, walk this way. Yeah, I didn't know that. I couldn't get close. So it was like, I gave up, I abandoned it at one point because it was, I couldn't get the starch. You know, Joey Kramer had that, there's a starch in that, that like, it's just, man, is it, it's like, it's just coming at you like a, 
And uh, I, my, I kept feeling, because the band was loose, you know, my band would like, we'd go into sections and we'd kind of breathe and fuck up and fall apart. And, and I, I felt that as sort of part of the glory of not knowing what was going to come next. You know, yeah. I never really knew what drum fill I would play, you know, ever in a take. Because it would depend on if, if Tom screamed or if Mike went or bend it up. You know what I mean? I was reacting constantly. So I was trying to be Joey Kramer and he was the wrong guy at the session. You know what I mean? Because he wasn't, yeah. that track wasn't reacting. When I would try to play like him, I couldn't get the band to react. They almost was like, what'd you do? What, what just yeah. happened? So I, I was doing a shit version of him, but then finally I just, I gave it up. And then I think I was probably freaking out because we weren't getting it taken. And finally somebody went like, oh, it felt pretty good. And I'm like, oh, well, there's a clue. You know, like, don't try to go boom, boom, boom every time. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk this way. It's every, I mean, man, you know, boom, da, boom, 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 ba, boom. And it was like, that isn't going to work for this song. It was just too, yeah. Plus Tom's talking. It's too, yeah. He's, you know, it's, it was it was too like for that, you know? Yeah. But, we were, I, I got to tell you, we were, when we first started playing that song, my band, I'm going to plug them, Grand Theft Audio. Oh, man. A couple of the guys are watching right now. Um, my, one of the, my bandmates, Paul Candelori, one of the guys who plays guitar, great guitar player and singer. Um, we were setting up the gear and we, I think we played the song once a one for the first time that night and we never rehearsed it. We all just learned it and said, let's try it. And he told me the story about how it was the sort of the groove was, a derivative of walk this way or and I, I you and I never talked about that and I did I didn't know that and then I thought about it and I said well I could I guess I can sort of hear it but but to your point if you had played it just like Joey did on walk this way it, it would have wouldn't have had anywhere near the like the, the character you know and the and the it would have been a different record yeah yeah and, and it, it yeah I mean there's there's before before they introduced the metronome into recording and all these rec these are all just live recordings that we're talking about um the, it was incumbent upon me to to support the vocal that was my gig and yeah. that would be changing too like that was a a movable feast so tom was sort of riding at the mic still you know like so I, it would be like up to me you know when he would say something like when you go Hey, or, you know, or something, I'd be like, I better react to that. I can't be going, blah, 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 blah. you know, I got to just get out. He, he, he's singing drum fills. So yeah, yeah. I, I either got to do it, do what he's doing or get the fuck out of his way. You know what I mean? So um, for me, the North Star has always been support a lead vocal. And that's where I got into trouble later when we, when records were make, being made where there's sort of like, there's no vocal yet. You know what I mean? You don't really know what the song is or it's gonna yeah. be on or it's gonna have all this. I'm like, well, what am I doing here? And oh, what you're doing is you're providing like a carpet bomb of rhythm that just stays out of the way. And that's really not what I do. You know, that's not really what I do well. Right. I, know, I understand the process of making records today and I, I get it, but really as a live drummer, my job was to, feel energy, what energy in, dig it, you know, go for something. I guess a live take in a sense is really what I enjoyed. Right on. And, and did that, would you say that process in terms of like when you, when you were really, I mean, I know you guys did records before Damn the Torpedoes, obviously, but would you say that process really started to really take hold around the time of Damn the Torpedoes where you were really fixated or focused in on like, Tom's vocal and 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 kind of where he was going and the first couple of records we were right there because we rehearsed those songs we knew those songs they were yeah. part of the live show they were the set I mean yeah. help we recorded everything we knew essentially on the first record and maybe we I mean we got Tom and I went in the studio one day just the two of us and cut a song together that ended up on that record and um. There were a few things that came together in the band that were experimental that made the record, but essentially we were a, a live act that would take the call the best stuff yep. and go make a record. 
you know, that was sort of how it worked. How bands did it then, right? So in other words, yeah, you, and, and I want to jump back a second, but keep talking about that because what, when did you guys, the sort of beginning of the band was, um, Tom, you, you guys knew each other from Florida, from Gainesville, but then he went out there kind of on his own and you went out there with, he went out with a band called Mud Crutch, which was Mud Crutch. Yeah. Yeah. That included Mike Campbell and Ben Tench. Yeah. I went out there on my own and Ron Blair, the original bass player, was in another band in Gainesville called RGF. And we all got together to make um the Mud Crutch blew up on impact. They went there and something, yeah. something yeah. happened. I wasn't there. I was um probably about a year or so behind them. And uh, my band had just broken up in Gainesville. So I went out, just said, I gotta get out of here and go. And, and what year was that, Stan? Excuse me, was it 75, four, five? Five to 76. Okay, okay. yep, sorry. And when I got into, when I got there, uh, Rob Blair was my neighbor. He was living next door. And uh, so Benmont, I ran into Ben. And we had always been friends in Gainesville. I'd known him. We were the closest in age. And um, we were sitting and conspiring one night and decided we were going to put together a band called The Drunks. And we had it all worked out, you know, like Back for More, the, the fifth was the fifth album, you know, and, you know, and, uh, you know. So Ben had, was writing songs and he had session available like at two in the morning. You know how that would happen. You'd be like, we got free time with so and so. And, um, and I went next next door and got Ron and said, "Would you come?" And uh, and he brought Mike and we played and it was pretty instant. The four of us. Then Tom showed up to play harmonica, and within about a day of that, Tom was like, you know, I think he probably was making a solo record at the time, and he just told his producer, he said, "I got my band." You know? Yeah. So it was it was like there was no thought about what the band would sound like. It was, um, I mean, I literally counted four and that's the noise that came out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nobody thought about like, you know, well, what if we, we should sound, it, there was no premeditated quality, actually no discussion. They were even the, the most uh, walled off people I'd ever met to that point, considering how expressive they were musically they were the most non-communicative group of men I'd ever met. But when the, when we made the noise, it's all you needed to know. Yeah. Wow. It was pretty cool. Like that yeah. was, it was instant. It was one of those like, I don't know why this works. Don't talk about it. You know? <laughs> we'll jinx it. Yeah. You had that and see in four minutes, fellas, you know, it's like, you know, so. And, and you were just like 20, 20 years old, basically. Yeah. You know? It's kind of like right around that time. Yeah, it was it was an extraordinary and you know, for me because I really did not know what was happening. You know what I mean? I mean, in every sense of the word. I mean, I didn't have it for my family. You know, my parents were school teachers. I none of this was in my blood. You know what I mean? I couldn't go like go to my uncle and go, "Hey, what's going to be happening in show business? Are we doing the right thing?" You know, it was just like, and we were stone broke and crazy, and and, and that was that. Wow. Yeah. Um, my friend Dave Stark, another great drummer, asking how much direction did you get when it came to your parts? Um, did he just throw up parts and say yay or nay, or did he tell you what he was looking for up front? I guess he's referring to Tom, maybe, or or Jimmy. I don't know. That's um, a Nobody cared about anything but what they were really doing. I never got any input. And I remember one day asking Jimmy, um, who I have a, a million moments with. Yeah. And and really the takeaway is, thank God you put up with me, you know? But it's, um, <laughs> it's uh, I remember going to Jimmy because Jimmy Jimmy had this thing and I'll, I'll do a bad impression too. It was, a, he had a kind of a high, you know, it was like a, a tough voice to, you know, to hear criticism from. And he was like, I remember saying like, Jimmy, what's going on? And he goes, I don't know, Stan, it's just a million miles away. It's a million miles away. And that, <laughs> and so I would say, uh, should I try boom 
boom, boom, or boom, boom, boom. You know, I was discussing a kick drum pattern with him. Yeah. He looked at me and he just literally, like, he threw his arms at me and he goes, what the fuck do I care? And I was like, right, he's big picture. Yeah. You know, it was like, and then I, I realized Shelly wasn't the guy to go to for parts, you know, because he was an engineer. He was in his own hell, you know, trying to figure out how to image this shit. And like, I got this giant drum sound and the guitar player can't even be heard anymore. So he's freaking out. And like, Jimmy's trying to figure out, you know, how, to, I mean, I need, sorry, Shelly's trying to figure out how to put the sonic puzzle together. Yeah. Jimmy's whole thing is, I have a songwriter who's very good and I will not lose this song under any conditions, you know, and MTV is coming out next week and you guys are going to be big. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he was a big picture guy, you know, thank God. And, um, but yeah, parts wise, it was hunt and pack, hit and miss, you know? I mean, some amazing parts. And I just want to read Dave, Dave Maddox's question before it disappears on me. But um, when did you feel, this is from Dave Maddox, when did you feel you got a handle on a different drum sound approach as opposed to the uh, V low tuning thing, the, or the very low tuning thing? So what's the... Um, so I think he's I think he's asking when did you feel you got a handle on on um, changing your your drum sound from the you know the big the thud the big thud sound to I, uh, what I, it evolved to I don't know that I uh, I never really did it was um I think the last recording I did with the band was uh, Mary Jane's Last Dance or whatever it's Last Dance with Mary Jane or whatever. Uh, the song with Mary Jane in it, <laughs> and as a, as almost a lark, I came into that session with a Noble and Cooley snare. Yeah, it was almost like a, a little bit of the middle finger. Like I'm gonna be, I gotta play the damn drums. Like this other thing is like a simulation of drumming. After a point, you know, after ten years of, you know, poof, lift it up. Poof, you know. Like I'm bringing in a snare drum I can actually play. And it's, and I think I set it up and before anybody saw it, we'd already cut a track. So get a handle on it. <laughs> wow. What a drum sound on, on that whole record, on that whole song, but the snare drum, especially. And you told me that, that that was a, no, was a six, six by 14 or six and a half maybe? Or? Uh, piccolo. Piccolo, oh, piccolo, no kidding. Yeah, got it, it's a little, a uh, blonde piccolo. You know the guy who's got yep. the little nugget logo. I mean, the lug and yep. you know, I think it's uh, what is it, die cast, real heavy rims. Yeah. And um, white coated head it was wide open. The thing was, but it's, it's somehow the noble, that small drum might have just been the luck of the, you know, tuning luck. It didn't honk. The microphone didn't hear the honk. Not at all. Yeah. It's just, you got so much crack out of it. It's just, yeah. It's wide open. It's yeah. just, probably for a piccolo, it's probably tuned a little low. Like when you, you know, you when you hear a piccolo in your mind, you're thinking, Stuart Copeland, you know, like the greatest yeah. piccolo sound of all time. Yeah. It's like, no, I, it was like, I was probably misusing, I was abusing the piccolo. <laughs> no, I don't have a handle on drum sounds, man. I, I don't have shit. I sit down every time to play the drums. It's always a mystery. You know, it's a mystery to me. Like, it's enjoyable. To me, it's like breaking the code now. It's like 31 left, 21 right, 51. And by the time you feel like you've got a great performance, you're usually a little burned. For me, I'm a little burned out. And it um, takes me forever because I'm a one-man engineer now, moving the mics. And, you know, you move your overheads a foot up higher, and all of a sudden it, it's too much or it's not enough. And you know, drums are weird, man. They're an acoustic instrument and they react to everything, including you, temperature, vibe, you know, they, yeah. they're, they're, they're fussy, but they're really, I mean, they're, they're nothing more fun. And plus the weird thing of being drawn and quartered, you know what I mean? And, and like asking every limb to work in, together, you know what I mean? But not really, you know, <laughs> like I need you to do this, but not really with it. You know, but it's in, you know, and then get your mind out of the game, you know, just to like play the drums, you know, just just to play the damn thing, you know, play what's fun. Exactly, exactly. 
I remember our, our friend Eddie Tadori is saying, Stan, do you remember using my kit at Sound City Studio B? Denny Cordell borrowed it from time to time. I was in Studio A. I think it was your first day of recording. Oh, wow. That's I cool. Think. I wonder what the kit was. I can't, I don't, I, I wish yeah, I, had. I don't. Damn, that's mm -hmm. cool. And Peter Erskine says hello to both of us. Mm, that's really cool. Hi back, Peter. From Stan and me. Absolutely. And um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Somebody had asked about the drum kit behind you, and it, we he might have missed the beginning of it when we talked about the fact that that is the kit that you used from 79 on. It usually didn't have a all up. Can you see the kick drum? I don't even know. Yeah. Yep. It a cut out head on it now. When we did all those records, all the lugs were off of it. You know what I mean? It was like strips or nothing rattled. And it was really packed tight. And the bass drum was really loose. It was an emperor. Yep. You know, emperor head. And it was tuned so loose. And just all, <clears throat> you were just getting all that attack. You were just getting, you know, just, just, like not, not, I won't say tone, but you weren't, obviously you were just getting the, the batter head and just all right. that. Punch. Yeah, you had, to, you had to be real careful about slamming. You know, it was like, kind of like it was, it was a trick, you know, and I mean, we were so, we were, I mean, I, I literally, we throw out a great take because there was a bass drum flam. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. For anybody under the age of 30 watching this, that's what, what happened. You know what I mean? It's like, if you, you know, literally, I remember the end, of, you knew you had cut a good take when you'd look over at the producer, the engineer, and they'd go, at the end of the day, like, shut up. Don't put your sticks down and go, what's up, man? Or, you know, like, how is that? Yeah, we need, we, <laughs> yeah, we need a, but that was always a great sign when, like, Shelly or Jimmy would go, like, like, fuck yeah, we're close. You know, we're getting close. You know, yeah, I just got like a, a I swear, like a chill when you did that because I could, I could picture that. I could picture, like, you know, everybody, you know, being hey. there for it. Yeah. And, and that feeling walk in the control room and, and you know you go and like jimmy would go like i think the last one was the one and tom would say something like you know usually be like no i think let me hear two first you know or something like that because we do them in threes for the tuning and the, you know it was like that was about what we had and i think a real tape would give you three at 30 ips three takes yeah oh you get it. you know what i mean and we were keeping them all you know what i mean so there's somewhere there's a 15,000 square foot warehouse full of 3M or yeah. and, uh, Well, you know, occasionally they'll play some outtakes on, on the, on the uh, Tom Petty station on Sirius. I've heard, you've probably heard them too. And, and, um, heard and about it's, them. what's that? Heard about them. I heard about them. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear them and, you know, you, you it's, it's always cool to hear, you know, whether it's Beatles or Stones or you yeah. guys and, and you kind of go, okay, now I see why they, they pick this one, you know, but it's always, as a fan, you're always excited to hear like a different take of it, you know, a different, whether it's a vocal or, uh, but I, what I've, what I, and you and I have talked about this a million times in private and when we did the magazine interview last year, but um, just the parts that, that you came up with, um, yeah, on all the records, but I, you know, I, songs like Even the Losers, I, I to this day, I think is like, it's just such a great part that that um, you know I, I can't imagine any other I can't, any other way of ever playing that song with those parts in it. You know, that's very kind. I appreciate that. That's that's really kind. I it's I am not objective about that work. I it's it, it's you know it's also been a long time. You know that was a long time ago. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting though. I do occasionally I'll catch a song on the radio and I'll, I'll turn it up now. I, you know, I'll actually just turn it up and I'll go, well, that, that's interesting. You know, and I can, I'm not, I'm amazed at, at the, um, some of the early stuff, the live feeling is really there in it. You know, like I'll go, oh wow, that really is a take. That's not a put up job. You know, it's like good, bad, or different. And, e and it, even, in, in, and in even the losers, there's a terrible drum mistake. And it's like, but it was like, it's, 
it's fine. I actually grew to like it. And for a while I was horrified. It's like, there's a spot where I go, like I hit a ride symbol, like yeah. something. I did not mean to do that. That's so funny. There, there, there was, um, I know exactly where it is and it, it, it's, a, it's a flub, but it's like, nobody really cared. Nobody, um, I think what it was is I was, I was at the time I probably had, um, I was still figuring out whether to have two Tom Toms, two rack Toms or one. Sometimes in the studio, they'd, they'd want a whole, you know, a whole Tom Tom yeah. And I think at that point I might've had a four piece kit and I thought I was going to, I thought I was hitting a Tom Tom, but I, Put the ride back in. You follow? I'm totally. sure. Yeah. Yep. You know, and it was like one of those like, and then when I did it, nobody. I thought was well, sure the takes dead. You know, but it was like too late because the there's a part coming after it where the the buffalo starts stampeding again. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, everybody's doing it. Tom, you know, everybody was like, you know, fired up. You know, guitars are flying. Ben's doing his thing, and and I figured, well. I figured they'll never go for that one, but no, it was weird. It was like, maybe somebody mentioned it once to me in the band, like Campbell probably went like, I don't know, weird symbol lick or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting symbol lick or something, you know, or something like that. He would have probably been the only guy to go, no, good luck with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think so that was, but I like, I like that now. I like that it's there, you know. I, yeah. So there you go. No, that that's cool. I and I you, you I never knew that too, and I knew I know exactly that spot you're talking about. I think it's the the vocalist got it such a drag when you're living in the past, or maybe it's a but, somewhere there. But the lesson to be learned from there is never stop a take. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Until somebody drags you away from your drums, don't ever surrender the take. If you're in a if, if you are lucky enough to be in a situation where you're recording live with no click and you're just working, um, it's not up to you as the drummer to stop. You right. know what I mean? Because you don't know. You really don't know. If you're in the moment and you're really playing your drums with all your might and with every, with all your, you know, with all your heart, you don't know if you're really, you don't really know if you're good or bad. You're not supposed to know. Yeah. That's, an, that's for someone else. It's like, this is an out-of-body experience. I'm freaking out. I'm digging it. I'm loving with, with everything. You know, you shouldn't be looking around looking for approval. You're just... You know. So I think that that's the lesson I probably had already learned. It was like, don't jinx. Don't be youth. Don't be the asshole that goes, oh, I hit the symbol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What the fucking great vocal takes, man? What were you doing? I could see Tom would probably run my neck. You know, because he was having a good, that was, a, you know, he was on a roll. And that, and and now, you know, as a producer, you can, you can totally relate to all these other elements that maybe just, as a drummer, yeah. Just in time for it to be vestigial. It's, um, it's, it's, I don't think that that style of music, I don't think the budget supported. <clears throat> I also think the times, you know, with, with, uh, with CD19, I don't know when we'll see 10 guys all piled into a studio working again. I don't know. And um, but the days of setting up your equipment and seeing a band in the studio, I can't tell you the last time I saw there was a I did an analog record several years ago. Um that was fun where we actually recorded analog takes, live takes, you know? Yeah, yeah, wow. That was intriguing, but they knew what they were getting into. Like this is self, this is destructive editing. If the guitar solo said, I think I can do another one. You realize that by doing another one, that one goes away. You know, and it was like, yeah. you know, and so there's it's the, the concept of destructive editing and live recording and how much tape costs and alignment. It was an interesting, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, but these guys were cool. They were a fun band and they, literally said no computers in the studio. I don't want any cell phones in the studio. You know, they were like, we're going back, man. Hardcore, yeah. They were young kids and they were really smart. Um, they were called the Howling Tongues. I think if you if they're probably somewhere on the internet, but there was a we did a live record and it was really cool. Oh I'll have to look for this. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean yeah. from they were a drummer with a I think he had a 28 inch kick. 
I mean, he was like, he's going for it, man. You yeah. know, 24 inch ride. You know, I'm like, he's playing. It's like, I couldn't stop it. Like, That's a lot of symbol noise. He's like, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was thinking about um, some of the some of the comments that that I'll refer back to the to the and people that haven't seen the magazine interview. But um, I, I heard "Stop Dragging My Heart Around" the other day, and I remembered back to what Russ Kunkel had told me and had said about you. And when I just asked him to give a little comment, and uh, and it's a, just another reference to just how iconic the part that song, especially like, has such an iconic part to it. And um, he said that when he when he was touring with Stevie Nicks, they played that song, and he played it like note for note. He learned it exactly like from the record because he didn't want to change anything. And that you couldn't have a better, you yeah. know, compliment. Well, Russ is he's holy shit. I mean, that guy. I, another guy when I first got to California, I, I met um, like Korchmeyer, Conkle, Bobby Glau, yeah, Billy Payne. Those guys were like the guard, you know. They were like they were the guard, man. You know, and like you were a little, you were a gym bug, man. When you, but it, I mean, but Bobby Loud became my friend. So if they were recording, you were kind of allowed to wander in, especially if you just kind of brought something nice, or you were just a good dude, or you just, you just yeah, like you, yeah, well, whatever. But Kunkel was always like, what a disciplined drummer. I mean. His sound, I mean, every, it was like Picaro. It was that thing where there's no, mis there's no accidents here. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, for me, I'm a happy accident. And it's like, Bobby Glaub was the same way. I remember saying like, do you really work out your parts? I remember asking him one day and he goes, Stan, I play every note. And I remember thinking, well, that's the difference between me and you. <laughs> <laughs> I play a few of them and hope for the best and, and take a lot of liberties. You know what I mean? Like, I don't play the same thing once, you know what I mean? Or back in those days. Now I've learned the discipline and guys like Korchmeyer and Henley have taught me that discipline of, look, man, there's a real reason why you need to be here today or not be here. You know, like, and you can prove that right now, you know, whether you need to be here or not. And that was really cool. And, and Don was wonderful to take me under his wing early and same with Danny to explain to me that there's a process to this. This isn't just, you don't just spitball and grab a shotgun and start wailing, you know? There's time for that, but probably not here. <laughs> and Kunkel was, those guys, all those great set, the guys that could play those sessions, there's a reason why they play on so many of their records. I mean, you can set your watch by it, man. They're gonna be great. They're gonna be great. Well, talk a, talk a little bit about working with Don. I know that, um... You played on um, End of the Innocence. You played on Heart of the Matter. Yeah. Oh, yep. That was my one and only really, I think my only real, that was it. And after that, I realized that what Don requires from a drummer is not what I really do very well. You know what I mean? But the sound worked. My sound, that was, that was this kid again. That was that, you know, I brought the sound, whatever that was. And um. But he, he was very specific because I remember he wasn't there. I tracked it early in the day and I had a bunch of ideas of how it would go. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, here's some cool stuff. And Don's like, no, man. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. You know? Yeah. And, like, and that's hard. That track taught me, like, it's fucking hard. This yeah. is really hard to be, like, metronomically good and that's when the that's when the book of job kind of came to me when i realized the drumming for me it's 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 leaving what i like to do naturally is not what's really required in the studio then it became time for like to to, to find the great drummers you know to yeah. find fortunately don would would find them you know they were phenomenal any caliuta you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm playing on a demo and Don's like, yeah, I'm thinking, man, I'm killing it. Don, Don will look no further than this amazing drum performance. You know, and, and he's looking at me going like, yeah, uh, it's got some something about it. You know, it'd be good for this. And I'm like, you know, as, as you can feel my, I'm like dying. 
but then but, but he says the Caliuda, and I'm like, you're right. I <laughs> never it would have never occurred to me that you know because but Don's like let's call him, and yeah. like he, of course when Vinny shows up with Neil Steuben house, it's like, well holy shit, you know like, I mean so it's it crushes your ego, just bug flat at the same time you you see an empire unfold you know it's like so that was like great experience with with don allowed me to do was to step aside and then he started to the drumming it was so sweet like we both we, we made a quite a few records together you know i'll ask him because he's a great drummer man yeah. don't don't kid yourself if this guy did not sing and produce and write songs better than almost anybody in the world, he'd be known for doing some amazing drum tracks. I mean, his method of writing a drum part was was so cool to audit, like to come in off the street and go like, you know, hey, I'm gonna get to watch Don Henley write a drum part. And, you know, for me, it's just you sit down, you spitball, you play drums. Don's like, you can see him writing the fills, like he's, if I lead with my left, I come out right here. Yeah. And he's writing parts. And I'm like, holy shit. And the sound. He's like another one of those guys. The stick is dead right on the right where it needs to go. Yeah. Yep. I can't play his drum set to save my ass. I sit down at his drum set and I feel like an idiot. Don sits down, sounds like a million bucks. But I Don, you want to play drums on this? And he, he referred to it as, no, I don't want to do the heavy lift. And I realized that like. The responsibility he taught me doing a drum track it's a responsibility man and you don't take it lightly and we're not going to get away with anything you know yeah. and so part of the matter was the um proving ground that i could do it but not a lot you know i mean i'm not the guy yeah and i learned that we could rehearsal with him one day i sat down to play with his band and i thought i was killing it and Don turned, you know, the hand, which is, is fairly notorious for the, that's his way of, you know, rather than, rather than sorry off the neck, he's more polite, you know, the hand comes, <laughs> you know, and I said, like, I figured, well, somebody in the band's going to get it, you know, <laughs> it's like, perfect, he walks back to me and he goes, you know, like, is that, is that the hi-hat always like that? And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even think, I wasn't even there, you know what I mean? It never even occurred to me. Like, so I, this, he hears things on a different level that I've learned to really appreciate. And it took me years to understand like what he's hearing, you know, but he, he's got remarkable ability to, to do these, to do things. Yeah. That, you know, he's a student. I mean, he's curious. And, and you know, I, and, and I, I would hundred percent right there with you. I, I think you know, I listened back to all the classic Eagle songs and, you know, as a kid, I, I just, I kind of just, I was too stupid to really get Don Henley as a drummer. Um, I certainly respected his, his singing and his writing and, and I loved the band. And, and I just, I, I, I wouldn't say I dismissed it, but I didn't, I really didn't appreciate it until I got older and I went, oh, and now like, again, I'll got to play songs. Yeah. We play some of their songs and, and it's like, Fuck me, trying to play like, trying to play Lion Eyes with that cross stick, eighth Fuck. note. <sighs> even, yeah. the, even, even the just a straight single stroke roll on Heartache Tonight that doesn't. Yeah. And then then not to mention one day we're sitting at his house and I just couldn't resist. And uh, his son's a good drummer too. And then his dad was up and uh, I said, man, you know, indulge me, man. Show me how to play Hotel California. <laughs> yeah. Indulge me. You know, it was like I can't sing it. I felt stupid asking, but it was like, and he sits down at the kit and you could see him almost like I don't play I don't play a drum part, I play the song. You know, you can see his mind like going like, well, when the band kicks in, yeah. Pavlovian, you know, he's like he falls in that trench. But he said, and I love it. He said something to the effect of, I think it's this, which was like, what do you mean? And but he did and when he did it, I went like there's no freaking way. There's no way. I'm not going to do that. It was just the, the ability. It was all like things were coming down at right angles and it was just yeah. great. So everything articulated, nothing slurred or sloppy, you know, it was just, 
you know, and that one hi hat lick in that song still mystifies me. Do 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the guitar. Yeah, yeah. Or just, just the little waltz feel on "Take It to the Limit." That that little ride beat that he plays is just. Well, how about the? There's a drum fill at the end of it where he does a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's one where he just kind of goes up. It's like. Like a single stroke roll between a bass drum and a it's yeah like, yeah oh cool, man that's like you, 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 an inch is a mile. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta I gotta tell you I remember um, I don't know how many years ago it was probably a, more than than I can even realize it was but I got a, a call from Greg Vicinet one day at, at the day after you had sat in with the Ringo Ringo and the All Star Band in Florida. Oh, right. um, and yeah, and he was raving about how you played um, with a little help from my friends. You guys double drum with Ringo out front. That was cool. Yeah, and and I I mean I just want to highlight that because I know Ringo was a huge influence in the Beatles. So to to be up there playing with him had to be like otherworldly. And I'm playing on this kid, you know. Yeah, I, I, and 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 I think I was at a blur, but I think he, you know he. he Kind of introduced me, which was okay. almost more than like you know, like uh. But I the think you did. yeah, the only other, I mean, we we were out on the road with Dylan back in the late '80s, and Ringo came to a show, probably in London, and I remember like uh, somebody said, you know, oh, I remember Bob's doing his thing, you know, he doesn't need the band, he's doing the Bob thing, and I'm getting up off the drum kit, and I look over and I see my flight case, and Ringo's sitting on my flight case now. I don't know about you, but this is one of those things when you meet someone that you, you, you idolize, you, it's not that you, you don't want to meet them unless you actually have something to say. Like, I don't, so I feel like, well, maybe I have something to say. He's at, at a gig. He's on my flight case. He probably noticed that I was playing drums. This will be the appropriate time. And the guy goes, would you like to meet Ringo? And as I'm walking over, I'm trying to figure out what, you know, what's going to come out of my mouth. Well, what came out of my mouth was so horrible. Uh, he's still sitting down, and I said something to the effect of, Ringo, wow, I want to thank you for my haircut, my house, my car. Um, uh, uh, and <laughs> as God is my witness, he reaches up and he hugs me, and he pats me on the back and he goes, I know, I know. And I realized every drummer has walked up and shit the bed. And yeah. it was, but I just, I mean, I think that's what came out of my mouth was something about my, like, literally like, like for my pants. I don't know what I was saying. Yeah. But it was sincere. You were, you were being honest. Yeah. Yeah. My entire purpose for being. Yeah. It was like, uh, and I did, oh, I know. Oh, I know. It was just. I the, the first time I met him, Stan, I said something like, yeah. you know, so I think back about it now, it's so stupid and, and like he's heard a million. I, I said something like, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't yeah. be a drummer. Yeah. And, and I think he said, I've heard that before. <laughs> I've heard. But, but I got to tell you, Greg, Greg, God is my witness. And he would tell you this, said to me without naming any names. He said, you know, a lot of people come up and sit in with the all-star band and play that song. You know, if they're in St. Louis, they might get, and he said, nobody played it like Stan. Nobody played the shuffly feel the right way. And I think I think even Ringo either commented to Greg or, or commented to you, I don't know, but but noted it like, okay. Well, you, I mean, some... Here's a sidebar. I shedded it, man. Like Greg sent me a video and it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's like, if you're going to, because he said, you know, you'll probably get called up if you come to the show. And I, I wasn't going to take any chances. It was like, I want to know how you guys play this. And I even, I shedded the fact that he didn't play Crash Symbols after the big fill. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's like, and it's like, because even Greg was like going like, wow. All right. Yeah. And it was like, it's like, I want this. It's, it's Reno, man. You know what I mean? I'm not taking I'm not taking any liberties. I'm not going to show him how the song goes. You know what I mean? It's like, 
You know how to. <laughs> did, you play the, did you play the big fill? Did, did you take that? Yeah, Greg and I played it exactly the same. It Perfect. was, you know, it was, I mean, it was pretty close. And, um, but Greg is also like, you know, come on, there's a guy. You just, yeah. you want to um, look good, sit next to Greg and play drums. You know, he's, it's like playing tennis with John McEnroe. You know, if, you, if John wants to make you look good, you get all baseline shots to, you know, it's like, yeah. like if he wants to make you look like an idiot, I'll think about a second, you know, <laughs> it's, it's that, that's what's so great about a guy like, well, Greg, I mean, the first time I saw him play, Myron Grombacher made him, made me aware of this kid, you know, he said, this yeah. is it's fantastic out of North Texas state. He's playing with David Lee Roth tonight before. So I'm like, hell yeah, I'm going, you know? So I go there and he just, you know, he knocks my dick in the dirt. He's just fantastic. Yeah. And so then the next day I, I think I called him just to tell him. I figured, you know, I, I didn't know where he, you know, but he's like immediately, oh man, the Willow Hills Drum Club, come down, man, come down. You know, it'd be great to see you. And he's like, I mean, I was immediately smitten. And then I went to his, because he's playing this monster kit. With me. Yeah, yeah. And I go to his house and he's got a Ringo kit. You know, and I'm like, okay, there's something happening here that we could talk about. And uh, immediately he would, you know, he went right down the Ringo flew with me, yep. you know, like where it lives. And this is, you know, I just think he was, he gave me, he's giving me some great drum lessons. I mean, some really, I mean, I'm still working on stuff. He, 87 years ago, you know, like I'm still working on that pattern, but it's so cool the way he thinks. And, I know he's, I, I met him around that same time. And, and uh, I met him in 85 before he got that gig through Myron he came into Simmons when I was working there. And he was just like this down to earth, nicest guy and within five minutes we were talking about Ringo we, we were just we just bonded and we still talk about that now like how like that first conversation cemented kind of where we were and then he got that gig and he you know it exploded and he exploded and then how unbelievable is it that all these years later he's playing with Ringo you know I, I, I say that to Greg it's like it's he's like yeah man I have you seen Greg solo in that show so, oh with David Lee Roth no, and, and, and with, with the All-Stars. Oh, this a solo? This man does a solo during the Santana medley. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Holy crap. Yes, right. I mean, like, I, at one point, I think I was watching it, and Ringo's on the other side of the stage, and Ringo's watching it. Now, yeah. you know, that's kind of a big deal if you're, because that could be a piss break. You know what I mean? Right. And he's just sort of watching Greg, and I think I looked at him, and our, you know, we had a moment, of, and all he said, he just went, you know, he, it was like, whatever that is, that's amazing. And it was like, you know, the way he's, Greg is just the gears, the beautiful gears, the way he, yeah. he breaks down. It's, he's a mathematician too. It's like yep. the way he play over the bar. And it's like, it's just, it's stunning. You know, that's he's, a, he's, he really is the complete package. He's one of those guys that, you know, can go in and do a session and, 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 you know, play, not be Jeff Beccaro, but, you know, play like a groove like Jeff or, or Rick Morata or somebody. Or like, yeah, or just... Such a dick, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, man, but but so I, I just, a couple of quick things, because I know we're getting close to three o'clock here, or we are at three o'clock, so I don't, I don't want to... Well, if you run out of things to ask... No, there's a million things. That we might have to do parts two and three is what I'm getting at. But no, I'm, I'm kidding you. But we talked about your drums, the Imperial Star Kit. Uh, we talked about the snare drum on uh, Mary Jane's Last Dance, which which I wanted to make sure we talked about, but you mentioned it. I know I shouldn't mention the P word, but I think it'll be interesting to drummers, the P word, interesting to drummers to know, for drummers to know, because this was always, you know, as a fan of yours, I always wondered what your symbols were on those older records. And and uh, and they were Peisty 2002s until I think right. around Hard Promises, maybe? Or just yeah, after? Right, that would be right. I yeah. might have been using the Peisty China type right around then still. Yeah, like Stop Dragging My Hearts to Peisty China. Right. Yeah, um, that, right around then, I, I and I don't really remember how that happened, but I, I guess, did you call me? What happened? Yeah, we, I, I think it was, I met you, I think, a little after that, but 
but somebody from Zildjian tracked you down, hmm. I'm sure. And uh, very nice. And well, it was it, it was I still got every symbol you ever gave me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so the Pisces were interesting with the they were, I'm not really sure the difference how to quantify it, but the Pisces they seem like they're they're more shimmery. Yeah, yep. Zildjians seem to have more body, but the Pisces, it seems like you can hit them harder and they stay musical. The Zildjians, if you crush them, they sound like they don't sound good. They yeah. actually plays. And Jeff Lynn taught me that because we were, we would do cymbal overdubs on the records we did. You know, I never, I rarely played a kit live, but he taught me too. Like he's, I'd set up cymbals and he'd go, nah, nah. And he's, you know, cause I would splat out of yeah. You go, no, you know, talk to it, you know, wa wash it, you know, like. Yeah, yep. The, Zil the Zildjians seem to, especially like the 18 to a 20 inch crash, like a big crash. Yeah. You can overwork it and splat it. It's just like, I do that by accident. I'll, I'll just hit too hard. And that's so a good, yeah. And that's a good way to describe it. You overwork it and, and you kind of, it's diminishing return as far as when you hit it past that threshold and, and, and you're on a Pisces, you know, it's a, it's a, it's in many cases a different alloy and it's a different sound. And, and I, you know, I, I think those songs, I can't imagine them without the sound, the way they, you know, not sounding the way they do, you know what I mean? They're like, that's, it's part of the, the vocabulary or the, the, uh, you know, the makeup of those songs is the symbols, the drums, they, everything you get. You're playing physically. If you're really a physical player, they will, they'll hang in there with you. Yeah. Like they're, they'll still like, the harder you hit them, the louder they get. You know what I mean? That's my yeah. impression. Yeah. I wish I still had my old Pisces because they'd be fun to record. I've got a set of sound edges I didn't get rid of, but all the other ones walked off. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know, buddy needs a symbol for a gig oh. Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah, that was so much fun. That was just great for everybody. Like, here. <laughs> like, all my buddies were drummers, and they were all, you know? <laughs> worked out fine. <laughs> well, you knew you just had to pick up the phone to give me a buzz, and... and... Yeah, you, you certainly did, man. Like I said, I've got the... Uh, there's some interesting Armands that you gave me. Yeah. Cool. There's some pre-aged that are really interesting. I've got a flat ride that's really cool that you gave me. I've got, and uh, they're old now. That's what's interesting. Yeah. I wonder, does a symbol just age or does it have to be worked to age? Well, a little of both, but I mean, just if, if this, just the symbol itself, even if it's just sitting for a long time, can can definitely mellow and, and age and, and, you know, in a good way and well, take on a different sound. Factory was really something. Yeah. I love that. That was a cool thing to see. Like I, I never really, that, that the puck actually had its home. Yeah, I know, isn't that something? Yeah, I was fascinated by that when we went to the factory. It was intimidating. The factory was intimidating. It's like getting all the pictures on the walls, like damn, this is, but uh, yeah, that was a cool, that was something to see. Long water, was that Yeah, one? Long water drive in Norwell, Mass, yeah. That's, what a, what a memory, wow. Sometimes, <laughs> what? <laughs> You know, the last, the last song I just wanted to reference, Tom Petty song, um, we're still good for another minute or two, but um, we were talked about this before, and I, I'd seen you play a bunch of times live, obviously, and, and I always assumed when you guys played Don't Come Around Here No More that um, you, played the, you played the drum machine part that was on the record originally when you played it live. You, you played that on the kit, right? You played like the... You had to kind of morph it into a live scenario. Yeah. An Oberheim drum machine. Yeah. And it's, um, but yeah, you, you can transpose a drum part onto a drum kit. It's a, it, it's, it was um, cl clumsy at best. Let me put it that oh, way. And it was, it was, and I didn't, I thought at the time you were listening, I thought there was a click somewhere so that you were, you were hearing either the, the Oberheim in your ears or in your monitor. And there was some reference that you were playing to. And when you told me that was just you playing. We didn't use a clock until, I think we, we did one tour. It might've been the last one we did where they, they put a clock 
on one song for a bass sequence, for an eighth note bass sequence. Like it just went do, 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 You know, but it was like, it was, that was not enjoyable for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get it and I get the challenge and I think it's, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing it. It's just, you know, at a certain point in your life, you go like, that's cool. Yeah. I don't have to eat that. You know, it's like when they eat your spinach. Well, not unless I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the sequence for me is that's where I watched guys destroy sequences like Picaro. I watched him on a couple of Toto songs just come in and there was a sequence that I thought was inhumane. I thought there's no way. The yeah. drum play gets his, huh, boy, was I wrong. And Greg, same idea. You know, you put up a sequence that's unforgiving. Yeah. Four minutes later, it'll be like, and he'll perform to it. It's not like he's just getting along with it. Yeah. He'll push that sucker around. And, um, you know, there's a lot of lot to be said. Like, you know, first time I ever really heard a sequence used to so that kind of benefit was we don't get fooled again. Yeah. I remember thinking, holy crap, that's the perfect marriage. If you can do that, you know what I mean? Like there's this wonderful sequence, but then Moon is just destroying it. You know, he's just having his way with it. He's raping it. You know? <laughs> sure, like, yeah. And there's, so to me, it's like that was, I was always hoping that maybe more of that in a sequence, not the, not the taming of the song, but the, how, how extravagant can you get with it? Yeah. That was, that really never happened for me. You know, <laughs> I never really well, got. <laughs> I, I, I think in that song, the studio version, that's you at the end of it, where you come in with that, you know, when you come in on the, on the snare drum and, Right, right. That I mean, to me, that was really that was such a great, powerful kind of like, you know, just, it turned into this. Dave Stewart, he just he was the one, you know, because I was sort of curious, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, literally, there was a, when I walked in, they basically wanted me to hit a giant crash symbol and say, "Hey, you know, hey," you know, it yeah. was like they had a fully realized vision of what that record would be, and that's cool, but it was like. This is a different, I'm on a different bus ride now. So yeah. it was kind of nice that Dave was like, you know, would you care to try your drums at the end? And it was like, yeah, let me, let me see, you know, proving that it was a good idea that I didn't play the whole song. You know what I mean? Because that's probably what it would have sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was perfect. And then the way you did it live was like, it was even better, I think, because you played that part and then came in with the drums and it was, you know, there's nothing more fun than a live band. I mean, that is really, I think, the true essence of the last bastion of of being a musician is to play live, you know, without a clock and to communicate with the other cats, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, that's, it's all of our versions of jazz at that point. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what we're capable of as a jazz player is to play rock and roll. You know, I can play a, four, four time, and I can still improvise. You know, like a great jazzer can take that to the next level and beyond. But really when you're playing live, that is that is our jazz. And that's that's wonderful, man. Yeah. Yeah. That, your action, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it can be different. You can, you can fall off and screw up and it's still good, you know, it's still cool because they'll go with you. Right, you know? yeah. Right? I miss those days more than anything of like, Oh, the singer didn't go to the microphone. Well, then I guess the song didn't start yet. You know what I mean? It's like, we're just pedaling the intro. Fine. Yeah. That's great. Versus if it was on a clock, it's like, holy shit, we got to report the sequence. Oh my God. You know, we're, we're screwed. You know, it's like, it's, I love that. It's like, singer's yeah. just, yeah, he's, he's digging the, I'm digging this intro. Go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know where to tuck it in. Let's go. You know, so that's, those are the glory. Those are, those are the moments I still hold holy, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's my wife. Hi, honey. Showing us eleven. My wife Kelly. And counting. Oh, she's giving me giving us the heads up on the launch. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. She's it's gonna happen. They didn't scrub it. I guess not. Um, it's Stan. I apologize. We didn't. I wanted. I made a note to talk about. We have to talk about your current projects, which we'll do. 
And I wanted to just put it out there how great a singer you are. Well, thanks, man. And 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 you truly are. And so we may have to do another one of these and talk about that. Okay, just like we said. No, cool. um, no the, um, I've been working on a couple projects with, with some guys that I really am enjoying. I've been enjoying join making records here at my own house. And you know the deal. You you do a lot of it via internet. Yeah. And that's okay. I'm learning that that's as long as I put a picture of the artist up on my computer screen and they're laughing at me, I'm good. You know. <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, that it, maybe if you could post a couple things after the show or something, would that be great? Yeah, I will. I'll put some links up the stuff that, that you uh, you're doing. Uh, do you yeah. want to mention their names just in case they're watching right now? And go for it, man. What do we got? We got the Speaker Wars are a, a band I'm working with a, a guy. Uh, John Christopher Davis, yeah, Alice, and he's really good. He's a standalone artist. We got together to write songs for his project. As a result, he said, "Let's let's work together. Let's make something together." That's uh, called the Speaker Wars. Yeah, that's really. Um, let me see what else we got cooking. Um, Dan Dan Baird music. Oh, Dan Baird, yeah, from the Georgia Satellites. Oh, oh, cool. oh Dan yeah. Baird, man. Um, he's a lot of fun, man. He's got a. We did a little project called the Chefs because it's an in-joke, but if you go to his website, it's an instrumental record. Uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, you, I love Baird. And um, then my buddy, uh, Jeff Sims, we, I did a record for him. It's his record, but I helped co-produce it for him. And uh, these are all fun. These have been all really good soulful things for me. You know, they're all, and I get to play my drums and play guitars and sing and get to do my thing, you know, which is it's all we live for. That's right. Awesome. Well, I'll put those links up when we're done and people can go and check them out. And um, yeah, that would be fun. I think you, you, you might find it. Uh, I, if you'll find something you'll find something there you like, I, I would think. I mean, you never know. I, I know we will. I know we will. Boy, we had a great, great turnout of people, too. I mean, at one point, a couple over a couple hundred. But I think even more than that, that's all I could see on my page. But I think there's even more than that. So anyway. Yeah. Very, very kind and uh, um, nothing but respect. You know, I appreciate all you've done for me over the years. You've been quite a soulful and kind man. And uh, I've always appreciated all your help. Oh, thank you. And likewise too, I I, uh, I felt like, you know, that like we talked about earlier, that first time we really got to hang whenever that in the eighties sometime, yeah. um, it was a, it was a, you know, a, a real mutual respect and friendship. Pleasure, man. It's been a pleasure, it's been a hell of a ride. Good. All right. All right. Let's go watch a launch. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Stan. Um, Want to wave goodbye to everybody? Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks. I really appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate the love and support. I really do. Thank All right. You. See you, brother. Talk soon.